Hello, and welcome to another week's uh, edition of Art Chair. <laughs> uh, we really need a catchy slogan. Well, I was going with both ends of the brush, but I don't even know what that. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, you're here again with us. I'm Bridget Ashwood, your host and moderator. We have with us as well uh, Meredith Dillman, Terry Rosario, Tom and Nimue Brown, Megan Congdon. Wait, Megan, how do you say your last name? No, you said it right. Oh, I did. Okay, the G yep. is not silent. Okay. Nope. All righty. Um, and we can go through and uh, do our intros. We don't have Ash here, so it's a little like, you know, I'm thrown off a little bit this week because we always start with her. But uh, we can, we'll start with you, Megan, because you're the first person on my <laughs> on my screen <laughs> down at the bottom. Okay. Um, what about me? I'm a writer in theory. Um, you're a writer in actuality. You actually, well, I guess. <laughs> I'm a writer. I'm a writer in process. How about that? There you go. That's good. Um, and but I'm interested in all kinds of art. I do lots of different crafting type things. I embroider, crochet, make jewelry sometimes, etc. That's about it. Right. And in today's uh, today's theme, we're going to be talking about um. Finding and, and doing art shows, the, the part of business uh, of, of an artist where you go and you're, you're presenting your wares live and vending to the public. And Megan's going to have a, a great perspective for us as far as like a buyer while the rest of us prattle on about the other side of the table. So uh, let's see, we'll go to you, Meredith. Hi, I'm Meredith Dillman, and I'm a fantasy and fairy artist. I work in watercolor, and I've written two watercolor books, fantasy... <laughs> now I can't remember the name. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Fantasy Fashion Art Studio and Watercolor Made Easy Fairies and Fantasy. And awesome. my website is MeredithDillman.com. Awesome. Terry, over to you. I'm Terry Rosario. My website is TerryRosario.com. Um, I create magical oil paintings in a classic illustrator style. Um, I'm currently working on a series that I've titled Ancient Magic, and that uh, series includes fairies and their companions, uh, companion creatures, whether they be from real life or from uh, my imagination. Um, my art is licensed to varied manufacturers that create uh, varied products, including figurines, mugs, journals, etc., and you can purchase any and all of those on my website shop. Tom and Ninway? Hello. <laughs> uh, well, collectively, uh, we are the author and illustrator of the Hopeless Main series, uh, published by Archaea, and our website is down there at the bottom. Um, I am well, let's illustrator. go ahead and say it, though, for our iTunes. Oh, that's right. Hopelessmain.com. Hopelessmain.com. Right. I say it too. I say hopelessmain.com. <laughs> hopelessmain.com. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, I am an illustrator of the weird, gothic, and steampunk for the most part. I do CD covers, book covers, graphic novels, and pretty much anything anyone asks for. I, apart from the Hopeless Main comic, which you can pick up at hopelessmain.com, uh, I also write Druidry books. Um, I'm you a blogger. Probably say you know. it's Maine like the state. <laughs> yes, <laughs> thank you important. for that. People get confused by that one. Um, steampunk. I do steampunk things. I do lots of gothic as well. Uh, and shockingly, given that I'm kicking around with Tom, uh, I will write almost anything short for money when it comes down to it, <laughs> and, and probably have at some point. <laughs> That's awesome. Word. <laughs> well, so let's see. Uh, so today's theme, as I said, we're talking about uh, doing art shows or uh, cons and things of that nature. And so let's see. Um, how many people, how many artists here have done various cons and shows? I think I know the answer. We all have. Oh, okay. yeah. um, and Megan has gone to very many of them. <laughs> well, very many of a couple of them. I have limited, you know, travel range, so... Right, right. I've been going to FairyCon every year for the past several years, and whatever happens locally in Philadelphia, I try to get to. Right. Awesome. Let's see. I think um, let's we'll start. Well, let's see. Let me ask. Do you guys prefer indoor or outdoor shows? Indoor. Indoor. <laughs> indoor. Absolutely. Pretty much. 
I sense. actually prefer outdoor sometimes. Whoa! <laughs> Meredith being the renegade. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because a, a lot of conventions, we get stuck in a dark room with sometimes loud music and yeah. fluorescent lights, which give me a headache. And oh. it's just yeah. not a fun place to be. <laughs> That's true. That's true. But I, I think you know, for uh, for a less eventful experience. Less time to <laughs> <get off. laughs> I mean, I think I, I, I had baptism by by like uh, by swamp flood at my first <laughs> ever like Spoutwood Fairy Festival. It was just like a monsoon. I mean, we were literally holding the tent down to the ground, and then at one point realized that that was probably a danger to us, and we should just back away from it, which you know we did, and we were utterly covered in uh, in mud. And then there was the epic year where everybody got um, poison oak, <laughs> which pro tip, pro tip, okay, outside your tent at an outdoor show, if people are tripping over vines that are growing up from the ground, just leave those vines alone. <laughs> Use your words to warn people. Do not go and rip those vines up with your bare hands and then apply suntan lotion to your oh, entire oh body. <laughs> because you'll end up with the most wicked case of poison oak where the sun don't shine. Let me tell you. It, it was not, that was not cool. But, um... So yeah, other than that, Spoutwood Fairy Festival is an excellent, excellent show. So how do you guys go about, like, finding shows to do? I think that's probably, like, the first question. Yes. Uh, when, when I first started out, I, I actually did a lot of um, outdoor shows. I uh, lived in Florida, and they're rampant down there. Mm -hmm. A magazine called Sunshine Artist, and they have a website, sunshineartist.com. Com mm -hmm. um, has uh, listings of shows across the country, and um, it was very helpful at the time to do that. And then um, through oh, it, has, it has listings of shows across the country. Yes. Excellent. Okay. Yes. Um, it comes out once a month. Mm -hmm. um, I was just looking into it again. Um, it's twenty bucks for an online. Uh, subscription for the year and not only does it have uh, <laughs> listings across the country but it also has um, advertisers mm -hmm. so for your tents your all that accoutrement that you need to, d to do a show whether indoors or outdoors um, advertisers and sunshine artists um, are there mm -hmm. Nimoy did you have something to add? Oh um I've completely gone blank. That's very exciting. Oh. When we started, what we did, we just said on Facebook, we'd like to get out more. Who wants us? And oh. people started saying, oh, come to this, come to that. So basically, we go where people say, we'd like you, because then we're guaranteed at least one friendly face if somebody <laughs> wanted us there. And it's usually good fun. And then once you get to an event, ask the other people who are doing the event which shows they like. Uh, and then this is one of the other questions as well. How do you tell which ones are good? Mm -hmm. um, the ones that the, the, the other vendors say are good usually are. Absolutely. Um, but, yeah, we also, we also watch uh, what our fans are going to and try to show up on those whenever possible. Things people say, can you get to such and such, we will try. Yeah. But, uh, mm -hmm. but we like to say yes. No, yeah. That helps. Right, right. That's, that's excellent, excellent advice. I think when you're just starting out, if you don't already have that pool for, to, to go to Facebook and ask, you know, um, like, like Terry was saying, you know, there's, there's online references, just Google it. A lot of the different, like, ASFA, Association of Science Fiction and Fantasy Artists, and would that be ASFFA? How many F's are in that? Um, <laughs> <laughs> what, what, Meredith? <laughs> Do they do anything anymore? I thought they had like a listing at one point, but it, even if they don't, I'm sure there's plenty of other organizations that have listings online. But that's a really great point: is like checking out Facebook and and just you know, Google is your friend, and so is Facebook with all the networking and all the shows. I actually, that fine. I actually have a hard time finding a a comprehensive listing of conventions online now. Yeah. There used to be one called Fanboys Convention List, which was great, and it sorted everything by date, and then you could also look by location, And but they stopped updating it. 
Yeah, I remember that as well. I think part of that is because a lot of shows would just kind of disappear and then new ones would pop up. And, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, for it seems like it's been a couple years now that I, I feel like I don't go a week without a couple of um, invitations for uh, something steampunk or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> if you do enough shows, people will just start emailing you and sending you stuff. Yes. Yeah. Nimue, are you flexing your fingers or no, 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 no. <laughs> gesticulating at you? Um, <laughs> there's a lot of stuff and not going to obvious places as well. Because if you go to like an art event, then there's going to be an awful lot of other artists there that you're competing with yeah. directly. Right. And little local events and quirky things and things sort of a bit off the wall can actually be better in terms of being the only artist there or the only author. So you've immediately got sort of more appeal. And, and it's it, those can be really effective. So not just looking at sort of what's obviously a match for me, ooh, I'm a steampunk artist, I better go to steampunk artist events. Mm -hmm. No, there are druids down the road, I'll bother them, that'll surprise them. And that, we sell more Professor Elemental books at druid gigs than anything else. And in a church. <laughs> and in that a church. That was really weird. We sold a lot in a church. <laughs> Odd places. Always for them. Yeah, sorry, Megan, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, to her point, I have been at, like, several concerts by local artists or touring artists that will have one or two artists of a different genre with them like someone who does visual art or someone who makes jewelry and they'll have a table set up at their concert and they're the only person there so they do a lot of business that's a great idea mm -hmm. that's a great idea yeah I had I remember a few years ago somebody saying that they had found um, a couple of local farmers markets and they were the only visual artists there at all, and they were selling, you know, kind of, you know, their art on sort of like gifty items, but they also sold a lot of prints, and that did really, really well for them. And I was like, that's a brilliant idea because, you know, they are no, there's no competition. <laughs> as said, so I think that's cool. Now, as far as fees, I mean, gosh, that can really vary. You know, that varies so dramatically from show to show. Um, you know, and, and the, the problem is that's where you've really got to kind of do your legwork ahead of time and ask, the, ask other people that have already done that show how they felt the return was on their investment. Because I definitely have done shows that, uh, you know, where I only just broke even or, or lost money. Um, and, you know, that's kind of subjective. Is it because you suck or is it because, you know, because the show didn't have enough of an attendance? The answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Nimway, go ahead. You've also got to take into account what your travel costs are and if you've got accommodation costs because it's really easy to just look at the fee and forget that there might be a whole load of petrol on top of that as well. So something closer can often be a lot more sort of economically sensible than whacking a couple hundred pounds of travel money on it. Absolutely. Like, you know, uh, very far away you're going to have to ship stuff. Mm. Um, also, do you have to pay extra fees for a table and chairs because some shows charge for that. Do you need electricity? I'll, you have to mm -hmm. factor all of that in and it's good when you're just starting out to start local. Um, yeah. I think definitely. Um, there's when we moved when I lived in Maryland I did uh, for a while I did like all the fairy festivals up in the northeast-ish area. I did Spoutwood Fairy Festival, um, Fairy Con, and wait I feel like there was another one. Didn't they do like Mythic Con or something like that for a I while? One, I did one of those, and then they moved that to Atlanta. But then I did also, I guess I did um, the Maryland Fairy Festival a couple times or something. But, um, um, you know, and everybody's different because I, I can, you know, you, you got to weigh, you know, the factors because I had plenty of artists, that uh, friends, that would clean up at those shows. And I only ever really, you know, kind of broke even at those shows. Um so, and it wasn't, you know, my work was selling well. It was just that my costs, even though I was local there, my costs were kind of high. And so, you know, for me, they, they weren't as, as much. I find now, having moved to Texas, there are, um, there's a guy that puts on Dallas Comic Con, uh, Sci-Fi Expo, and Fan Days, all in the same location. And it's the easiest show I have ever done. You drive up. You take your trolley out of the back of your truck and you just go up a ramp and right into the hall, and you unload. And it, it takes. We're like really good at our at our pack up and our um our setup and our tear down now. It takes us like 25 minutes. So yeah, so you know, bam, right? So we're like up, and it's it's like a $200 for three days show, 
is, is my space and it comes with your table and two chairs and it's like 200 bucks or something like that don't quote me on it it's less than three and um and I do a killing because it's mostly comic book artists there and you know and there's like some steampunk jewelry and then there's a lot of comics and things like that but all the art is really focused around comic book artists and so but that was that's a another tangent for like a, maybe a little bit later because that was kind of a different environment getting used to being at these cons where it was clear to everyone that this was your art and your imagery that was out of your mind okay yeah. and then going to a comic con and people are asking you know what franchise is this from are these your characters you know and, and I wasn't thinking of my pieces in terms of characters you know and then, of course, you're being asked to do, like, uh, sketches and commissions and things. And so that just was a different experience. But um, let's see. Okay. So uh, moving on to that, what kind of what things would you guys say are essential to your setup? Oop, I hear some hideous feedback from somewhere. Merchandise and a piece of cloth. <laughs> <laughs> Merchandise and a piece of cloth, absolutely. Um, I think the most important thing is to try to get some vertical space. Yeah. Uh -huh. Beh now behind your booth. If it's all sitting on the table, people will just walk by. <laughs> so you can have, you can have grids. There's like the thick grid wall panels or those. A lot of people use those little metal cube shelves that you can get at Target. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I have carpet panels that I got for art fairs. Yeah. Those are really nice. Yeah, those are cool. I use, um, it was it was actually at the comic-oriented uh, shows where we saw other people using um, photographer's backdrops that you can break down, like portable photographer's backdrop, Ooh. okay? It was like 150 bucks for this kit. Two drop cloths, one black, one white. We use the black one, okay? And you just kind of set it up, and then you just... Um, they telescope up to a really high and are very effective at blocking out any obnoxious, you know, <laughs> stuff from the people on the other side of you. And um, you can also... Um, a lot of the, the people there will take just their 8x10 prints and kind of thread them together in this big panel that they then hang uh, from that back uh, photographer's drop cloth. I keep meaning to just make some vertical banners and stuff and hang them up, but you just get um, clamps, like metal clamps from, uh, what's that place called? Home Depot or whatever. <laughs> just some metal clamps and we just we just throw the backdrop on, clamp our signage on it, and then telescope that thing up, and that has been the best thing we've had behind us ever. And it just comes apart like that and fits in the in the truck really great. And then um, what did we get? And then of course tablecloth. But because you can't count, I don't care if the paperwork says that the table will be covered. Don't believe them. <laughs> no. Bring your own. Be covered with something. <laughs> you, yeah, you never know what it's going to be covered with. Right. Just don't even worry about that. We go and and I have um, uh, basically we we got uh, the plastic table skirts from like the party store, and black, and you can just reuse them. And I don't tape them up like they have a tape thing that you can tape it to the side of the table. Don't do that. Get yourself a staple gun and you just tape you know staple gun it around the table, and then you throw your other tablecloth over top of that. And so that gives you you know if, with the the length of the table covered, you have all this storage space for all your stuff underneath of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then we got... I um, use a, uh, a table, I use um, just lengths of fabric, mm -hmm. and if you get, um, it would be a knit fabric or a stretchy kind of fabric, you can wad that stuff up mm -hmm. and throw it in the box, mm -hmm. and, it, yeah. and, and it never wrinkles, you pull it back out, and you just have to make sure that what you've got is long enough to cover it down the front. Yeah. I got a pre-made table cover online really cheap. And For cheap you did? polyester or something so it doesn't wrinkle and it has like a Velcro thing in the back so you can pull it up and store your stuff under it. 
See, I'll be needing that link later because I want one of those, <laughs> but I haven't found like the for cheap. I, like, I think that's it's from Amazon or something. Oh, really? Hmm. I'll have to look into that. The problem is you usually get different sized tables at different conventions. <laughs> yes, there's that. It, that's yeah, that's definitely true. But I found um, I I. The rule I have is like everything I bring, with the exception of you know the uh, of the backdrop case or my tube that holds my banners in it. Like everything has to fit into a big plastic bin, even my display items, because I will not. I pity the people that I see wandering around like holding, you know, this handful of just loose random crap in there, and everything <laughs> falling every which way. And so everything has to go in a bin. But um. I'm curious, with your prints, you guys, how do you display your prints? Do you just throw them out in a bin? Do you intersperse them? Uh, do you do a book? I got... I got a, um, from Lowe's mm -hmm. uh, little plastic things that almost seem like they were for the, in the kitchen section, mm -hmm. and I covered them with black fabric. Mm -hmm. So and they're individual. They're probably um, ten inches long and three and a half inches tall, mm -hmm. and these fit all the prints. So that there's a you know a variety of prints. Um, then I use cardboard boxes underneath uh, mm -hmm. black fabric that's been draped over the table, and th so they're tiered. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's how all the eight by tens and the five by sevens are are all displayed. I take a, and then I have one basket that fits the the uh, twelve by eighteens. I think um, there's there's like some artists that do bins and some that do books, and then I'm like in this transition period. I'm curious, Megan, what do you prefer as you know a a buyer, a person? Um. <laughs> I haven't really encountered that many people that display their prints in books, actually. Uh -huh. um, bins are fun. I mean, I, I, I like the bins because you can browse through easily if they're not packed in too much. I think some people get a little bit over-enthusiastic with putting things on display and they've got too much out at once. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I think, like, one of each print at a time is probably a better idea if you have enough to you know, make it look like a good display, because I know it's frustrating sometimes when I'm in a show and I'm trying to browse someone's prints and they've got, like, six of the same one mm -hmm. all in, and I'm trying to see what what their, you know, what their art is, not, you know, go through a can. I know you have this many for sale, but what about your other paintings? Right, right. So, um, but yeah, I think, I think, I mean, books tends to be a little bit I I don't know it's it's it, for one thing it's hard for more than one person to browse at a time if you've got that yeah. because right. you usually just have the one and right. also I think they start to look a little bit messier sooner because they're being handled so much with all the page turning so and a lot of people don't actually I find this more with like people at conventions who sell cards Mm -hmm. Whether they're art cards or trading cards or whatnot, the binders start to look gross after a while, and people don't replace the plastic pages. Mm -hmm. So, overall, I'd say the bins are probably a better idea. I think a lot of people use the books because they might be traveling from one side of the country to the other for a convention, and there's just no way to bring bins at yeah. all. Right. I yeah, did that once, and I could not. I couldn't find any sort of foldable bin that I could stick in my luggage. <laughs> yeah, that would be that would be the ideal. What did you say, Tom? Oh, I just we do we do most of our events by train, mm -hmm. so um, bins is pretty much out of the question. We're probably the wrong people to ask because what we always do is bring blue tack and count on the fact that there's going to be a wall somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you hang all your prints up, but are you, can you manage to get them all hung though? Yeah, so far we've got we've got four large ones at the moment. Okay. Um, we, if see. we start expanding the range, we're going to run into trouble as far as that goes. But. I see. So you have a limit of of what you have, because whereas yeah. I have you know hundreds of images that I'm bringing. 
So that's yeah, that that would be harder. But but definitely that shows you the it's a very good idea to have of the big image hanging on the wall behind you though is is yeah. essential because if you don't have anything there, people are gonna just walk right past you. We also dress up. I mean, it doesn't matter where we're going, not just steampunk events, but I'll stick on the top hat. Tom will have the jacket covered in spoons. Mm -hmm. That draws attention. So even if the stool is a bit basic because we have to wear it on the train, you can wear the hat on the train, and um, it, it draws people in. So if you haven't got the means to do a really dressy stool, stick an interesting hat on or something, go like a pirate, people will talk to you, and they will go, why are you wearing that thing? Yeah. And then you go. <laughs> yes. there's, there's always other ways. Why the spoons? Why the spoons? Yes, we are our own verticals as well. <laughs> yeah, I I know what you mean. I I used to wear this epic top hat. I you can see it wait behind me. Ah yes. Just wait. <laughs> All right. I remember. Okay. I, <laughs> I couldn't. Uh, um, and it was just so heavy. I had a raging yes. headache. But I, I you like, had that on the first time I met you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And I remember you had that on and like you were painting and I'm like oh, why was, why would you do that to yourself? It was a bad <laughs> idea. I mean it was just this huge like I have, it's like an authentic collectible pair of like Halcyon motorcycle wrap around lenses on the top of it that weigh like fifty pounds and then a stuffed squirrel and all my buttons and stuff and then oh yeah, yeah. So that's great, but I need a lighter hat. Um, <laughs> but you're totally right. Dressing up, yes, I mean, absolutely gets gets lots of attention. Um, but yeah, I'm interested to hear that. Thanks for the feedback about the the art, the print bins, Megan, especially because I was de oh yeah, there you go <laughs> with her fancy hat. It does weigh a lot. And your fancy goggles. I don't, I don't um, think we can do the coat. <laughs> Um, the bins are definitely better because people can. Oh, spoon coat! There it is. All oh, right. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Sorry. Sorry, Meredith. What were you saying? The the bins are better because people can just pick up what they want, make a pile of it, and hand it to you. And yeah. step, if you have oh. a book, they have to flip through and ask for everything, and then you have to package it. And it takes yeah. a lot longer. Yeah. Yeah, I I, agree. I understand the functionality of the binders, and I mean that's how I store a lot of the prints that I've collected now because I have so many of them. But just as long as they're well maintained, because I think it's yeah. easy to let that slip, and it makes people not want to look at your stuff if they don't look good. Yeah, yeah, I kind of went with both at my last show. We had um, a binder which didn't have quite everything in it, but had a lot of it, and um, I made sure I did not puncture the prints. I bought the the plastic sheets where the whole image can be in it because then if I ran completely out of something I had like an extra one in the binder um, and it, it went okay I mean I felt like just as many people it kinda confused people they sort of thought that there were some things in the binder that weren't out you know in the bins and, and I don't know how effective it was because um, it tended to sort of block access to the table so I guess that's kind of your mileage may vary sort of a thing um, let's see what other vital thing. Oh, when we're talking about like cool supplies, uh, some really cool stuff we found here at Hobby Lobby in Texas were these collapsible corner shelves for like knickknacks. And the way they're made is like um, is that they will completely collapse because the shelf acts as the stabilizer. So the shelves fold up and then the whole thing shuts on a hinge. And I've seen other things designed that way. And these were fantastic because they also fit. They fit perfectly on, um, I'm gesturing as if people can see me, and you absolutely cannot, I, I realize that. Um, <laughs> they fit on the corners of the table, like, perfectly, and, and tuck right up against it, because they're corner shelves, and then you've got, like, two shelves above the height of the table that you can kind of attach, you know, your credit card sign and some statuary or different things to, uh, which that brings us to money. <laughs> I would say my number one tip is do whatever you can to take credit cards. <laughs> yeah, um, the easiest way I found, and it's it's new, it's uh, PayPal, mm. um, and PayPal has their little what is it called? PayPal here, mm -hmm. and it attaches directly to your phone, mm -hmm. and. Okay, now I'm going to hold it up just like you know everybody can see it. It attaches to your phone, 
and it goes straight through PayPal. Um, they're the least expensive of the different variations. Square is a little more expensive than the PayPal one. Mm -hmm. um, not by a lot, but... I use um, Intuit Go Payment. They're the people mm -hmm. that do QuickBooks. And just because, um, honestly, when I needed one, Square wasn't quite ready for prime time. And so I went with Intuit and I love them because you can totally get somebody on the phone if you need help. Mm -hmm. it's great. Um, but I don't know. I mean, there's there's plenty of them these days. But I think one tip too, um, if you don't have a smartphone, invest in uh, like an iPod Touch, and then um, it, at certain locations, if they have free wireless access, you can go ahead and uh, run the credit card through the wireless that way on an iPod Touch. Or if you really want to, you can also um, buy yourself like minutes on a mobile hotspot, so that whenever you're at a show, you've got these, you know, these minutes for like your own Wi-Fi access just for the duration of the show. Which, you know, at least, I mean, that's a bit of an investment, but that keeps you from having to sign up for a smartphone contract if you want to avoid that. Um, let's see, but yeah, I, I think that had, that made a tremendous impact on my sales at mm -hmm. every show. Fully half. I used to have one of those hand imprinters, <laughs> and that was fine for a while. And it got to a point where, like, I'd be selling to teenagers, and they'd yeah. look at it and go, "Ew, that's old school." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but now I kind of wish that I still had that because I have Square now, and I've done some art fairs that are out in a small town, and no artist could get any sort of signal and we all had electronic payments now and nobody could take it. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. That's a challenge. I think, um, but see, so you would take credit cards then though, the traditional way? Because I always got burned. I stopped doing it. I never had a problem with it. Really? Yeah, I got burned once for three hundred and fifty dollars on an original hand painted drum. This is back when I charged only three hundred and fifty dollars for an original hand painted drum. But um, I used to work in debt collections, so I tracked them down and called them at home, and they gave me another card. So, I, oh, girl, dreams if you rip me off. <laughs> I think with the service I had, I had the option to. They had a little phone system there you could call in the number. Yeah, so if it was a really large purchase. I would do that. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Uh, we always figured that, at, you know, after that we made a rule like, okay, if somebody wanted like an original, if it was a couple of prints, whatever, you took the risk, you know. But if somebody wanted an original for that price, uh, we always said that we needed it for display purposes, for the length of the show, because a lot of people had come to see it, and we would ship it to them after. And then that way I could go home and run through their card, and if it didn't fly, then then they didn't get it, obviously. <laughs> Good idea. <laughs> Let's see. And that brings us to the ideas of, like, um, product and pricing. And I'm going to start with Megan on this. Megan, when you go to a show, do you prefer when the artist brings special items that maybe they you can't get on their website or online? Do you prefer if they maybe have special show pricing, like, you know, some deals and some things and stuff like that? I don't doesn't really come into my consideration of <laughs> buying things honestly. I'm a browser. I walk around and look for something that captures my interest and you know, if it's affordable, I mean I I, I don't really have a hard and fast rule. I mean I'd I'd pay more for a print from one artist than from another depending right. on the quality. So Right. You know, it it's you know, it's it's a nice incentive if you have something special, but on the other hand, sometimes it's easier, you know, because a lot of people have limited resources, so if you know that you'd be able to go home later and buy something from a particular artist that you can't get at the moment, I will usually give that person a sale later if I can't get something from them then. Mm -hmm. Um and again, I, I, I haven't really seen that that much, honestly. I mean, it's something that seemed to have been more prevalent a few years ago when artists would do, like, a convention-exclusive print. Mm -hmm. And, I, you know, if, if I liked it, I'd get it, but it's never, like, 
I'm not that kind of collector that I need to have an exclusive, you know? It's right. okay. more whether or not it appeals to me, so... But yeah. I know there are a lot of people who are very into that, so my point of view might not be, you know, a majority opinion. No, but it, I, but it's still, you know, valid, and it's, again, it goes back to the, you know, your mileage may vary, and it depends on the show. I mean, I've definitely seen that seems to be a trend at, um, at the comic and sci-fi based shows. Well, that that's okay. the cornerstone of that kind of show, especially yeah. the bigger ones, and a lot of companies hype up their convention exclusive but I'll tell you a lot of those convention exclusives don't sell out at the show and end up on their website later that's what so. I've seen so <laughs> why bust your butt you know as an artist I, I, I have a number of friends I'll hear from a number of friends before a show oh I'm trying to get one more new thing done before this show and it's like yeah but you know that thing that new thing you did last month you know that that's still new for the show people yeah a lot of people haven't seen that, that yet so you know so don't don't bust yourself um as far as what about pricing though like um do you have any expectation when you go to a show that pricing should be a little lower than if buying off the website because this is something i hear a lot of really I mean, personally, I don't because you're not paying shipping. So if it's, the, I actually find that it's more economical to buy from someone at a show if I have that option, uh -huh. because even if the prints are exactly the same price, I'm not paying six or seven dollars to have it mailed to me. Uh -huh. You know, so uh -huh. I I have no problem with that. You know, I don't see. I mean. I don't know. It's 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 not. You know, I don't expect it. Right. I think that's valuable feedback because that's something I hear again. I hear from a lot of artist friends is that uh, um, they'll lower their prices at a show, and I'm always making the argument that you don't need to do that for exactly that reason because of shipping. And there's this perception that people expect things to be cheaper at a con, and I don't know where that comes from. Meredith, got any insights? Um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Mine basically the same price. I think I lower some of the eight by ten prints one dollar just so I don't have to deal with change. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah, that that is one thing that is that is usually easier if something is not a weird price, mm -hmm. like somebody charging eight dollars for a print, and then they don't have change. The person doesn't have change. Mm -hmm. Eight dollars is a ridiculous amount of money to put on your card for something, and uh -huh. it's inconvenient for everyone. So yeah. just make it ten. If you make it ten, they'll pay. It. They'll still pay for it. You know that I will. I will agree with. Now, actually, my eight by ten prints are cheaper at shows, but for a different reason. Not because I think that they should be. Okay, but it's all based around. Um, my laziness at making change and my sort of magic <laughs> price points because uh, I worked in retail for years and I definitely saw the psychology of, of price points, right? But um, I don't believe in that whole like, you know, fourteen ninety nine thing. I think that that really doesn't give people credit to for <laughs> the intelligence that they have. Like it's $15, okay? You're not fooling me, right? Um, but I think it's, it's definitely important when you're doing a show. Like just don't make don't put change on any of your prices. That's silliness. <laughs> Just do what you need to do to make the, to make this a, a bills only transaction, okay? But my eight by ten prints at shows are twelve each or two for twenty. And I'm like revealing my secrets here, and hopefully my customers won't hate me because of this. But there, it's because the psychology of that is that most people will buy two. I started doing that too, and it works really well. Doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I know, man. Uh, Jane and I, my girlfriend Jane Star Wales and I, have done a lot of art shows together where we've been right next to each other. And she charged fifteen for her prints, which is what she charges all the time anywhere, right? And I charged twelve each and two for twenty. And she would get so annoyed with me, and she's like, "Oh, just people just forking over that twenty, aren't they?" And I was like, <laughs> "That's what comes out of the ATM machine, man, when they go get cash." So she changed her little sign, you know, and suddenly, I mean, it, it, her art is incredible. Of course they wanted the art, you know, but so she was selling prints, but she was selling kind of like one at a time, 
you know, because mm -hmm. 15 is psychologically close to 20. But when you factor in the cost for your prints, which I'm not going to say what they are, but they're, my profit margin is very good, um, you figure in the cost for your prints, I'm not, I, I'm still improving my profit um, by selling two at 20. That's a really good profit margin for me. And if you have people who are looking at all of your prints and they can't decide on one, that helps. Right, right. And here's the other genius, okay, work in sets of four. Okay. <laughs> Anything, any new series you do, okay, which I have a bad habit of stopping at three. I've got to stop that. But any new series you do, like do four, four. okay, because then they want to give you two $20 bills because they need <laughs> more, right? So at a show, that works great. Um, so would you, do you think you would make the same amount of money if you charge $20 per print? I don't know that um, you know I don't know what I do is I is I offer slightly bigger size prints and those are 25 so like I have 12 by 15s that are, that are 25 dollars and <clears throat> my costs to make those prints are not that much more than my smaller size right. so my profit on one of those is, is very good um, yeah, I don't know. I, I'm so reluctant to abandon my 1220 model. Like, <laughs> yeah, I think I think the twenty dollars is a little bit high for like the standard eight by ten size print, and it might scare some people off because most people price lower than that. Mm -hmm. I think fifteen is about average. So, yeah, fifteen is what I charge for my eight by tens. Mm-hmm. Um, That's what I charge online. Yeah. And yeah. thirty for the twelve by eighteens. Right, right. Is that now? Are they jacles or? No, I have. I do photographic prints. Ooh, um, okay. So they're nice. They're super. Yeah, nice. okay. yeah. These. Uh, I had. I, I was doing the jacles, um, and I would prefer to take my printer and throw it off my roof. <laughs> And, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's uh, it. Just it just got to the point where it just it it was. It, um, I mean, seriously, I would rather use it as an anchor, um, a very expensive anchor, than ever print on it again. Really? Um, Which printer did you have? It's an Epson two twenty. Oh, oh, two twenty. Oh, oh, two twenty hundred. <laughs> yeah, it's just it's it's insane. It, it oh God, I you know. And the photographic prints that I have done, um, it's a new printer uh, called Print a Few Things. It takes a long time to get your prints back, but the quality on a 12 by 18 is phenomenal. Is it good Abs pricing? Uh, I'm sorry? The pricing is good? Oh, ridiculous. ridiculous. Oh, yeah? Okay. I'm not telling you what it costs. But <laughs> no, 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 not live. Like we'll get into that later. I use a, uh, I use a Costco Photo Center. <laughs> the, the thing that with Costco that I didn't like is that all you could get was the glossy, and you couldn't get a matte finish. And I wanted a matte finish. Um, right. I, for my eight by tens, I use High V Photo Center. Mm-hmm. Oh, hi. I'm writing these down. Okay. Um, yeah, you can get a luster finish on. Uh, now, uh -huh. yeah, at Costco Photo Center, that's that weird. You know, it's like a subtle, like pebbly. I mean, it looks really yeah. nice, but it's not Is that matte. new. It's like a satin. Yeah, I think it's newish. Oh, okay. I'll have to try them again then, because Costco creates my journals mm -hmm. and my mugs. Okay. Yeah, the mugs I haven't done through them. The journals are they spiral bound journals? Spiral bound. Okay. I. Have a question for you about that that I don't want to say on the air right now, just because you know we we all have to have our little secret. So I'll ask you when we finish this part. Um, okay. okay, yeah, <laughs> trade secrets, guys. I don't I don't want to throw under the bus, but I got a question about that. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's see. Um, so that was a nice little like printing tangent there. Um, but yeah, I think it's. Oh, actually, that's right. That brings me to our next idea with this. Okay. I think it's imperative when you're bringing stuff to a show to, and this is horrible, 
because I don't want our customers to feel like we're manipulating them. So just everybody, just shut your ears right now. If you're not a fellow <laughs> artist and you're just a customer, just just shut your ears, okay? <laughs> All right. Now I'm gonna. Oh yeah, that'll work. This is just between <laughs> us, okay? Shh. This is just between us, okay? It's important to pay attention to what you bring to a show, and I I gotta say, well, I don't, you know, that I don't like to bring the stuff that I call the piddly shit. Excuse my French. But <laughs> the piddly stuff, the little piddly stuff, okay? Like <laughs> bookmarks and buttons and now other artists do and they swear by it. They do really well with it. So I think you have to figure out what works for you. For me, I don't want people spending their money on a $2 bookmark. I want them upgrading. I want them spending at least, ugh, like at least $6 at my table. Preferably well more than that, but anything, I don't sell things under $6, and actually at this point, I don't sell anything under 12 So what do you guys think of that? I used to bring all the little things. I had $1 <laughs> buttons and magnets and everything you could think of, and I still bring bookmarks, but mostly just the prints and a bit higher price stuff, just because it saves a lot of time. I don't have to make all those little things and yeah. <laughs> track of them. Yeah, we, we don't I, have any. Even with just the prints, I run out of space on my table. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Tom? Yeah, we don't, we don't have any piddly, what is it, piddly? Piddly shit. <laughs> Whereas the French would say sans piddly shit. Thank you. Um, I've looked at it on other tables, and I think it's cool, but then I start looking at Actually, what I look at is the fact that, you know, like postcards and things like that, mm -hmm. you price them out and you're not, the, uh, the, the markup on those is tiny. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't have any space to lug anything that's not yeah. really paying its way. So, we so I, I like looking at other people's piddly shit, but <laughs> we, we ain't making no piddly shit. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> it's not worth it. In the iTunes catalog, I have this listed as clean. It's a clean show, and I don't know if I'll have to change the rating this week. Oh, yeah, you have to have an explicit rating. I know. We said the S word. Uh-oh. But I'll um, say I, I generally don't buy that stuff. I almost don't even look at it. The exception okay. would be figurines if they're well-made figurines and jewelry if it's nice jewelry. Mm-hmm. But bookmarks, you know, I have a couple, like, I have one of Meredith's old little mirror compacts that's still in my purse to this day because I use it. But I don't buy keychains, I don't buy, because it's like, if I'm interested in the artwork, I want it to be, number one, big enough so that I can see it. Mm -hmm. And two, bookmarks are, you know, get an index card. They're they're useless. I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, it's like if I'm if I'm spending money, I want you know it. They're they're they're. I don't know. I don't. I I think they're they're kind of a waste of time. You know, postcards maybe. I honestly, I'll tell you, I'll get a postcard if it's a piece that I like, but not enough to put on my wall. You know, if it's like I think this is a cute picture. Right. And they have a postcard of it because that way I don't have to spend as much uh -huh. to be able to see it. But on the other hand, I could just put that towards a larger piece by the same person. That's something I like better. So yeah, but I think I have cards from other artists, and I just tack them up on the wall and my. Yeah. I, I have limited space though, so at this point mm -hmm. I'm all about you know value for money and do I really need this. You know, yeah. ten years ago, I bought a lot more art than I do now because I live in an efficiency apartment and there's no place to put it. Mm -hmm. right, you right. know, so I had done a big run of um, four by six greeting cards a while back, thinking that they would sell like blazes at shows, and it was just crickets. And they don't sell, and now I give them away in orders for free. I don't even bring them anymore. They're a huge waste for me. It depends and, yeah. on the show. If yeah. If people bring their kids, they will buy the small things for them. Right. And sometimes at the fine art fairs, people are more, or craft fairs, people are more interested in greeting cards, but not at the sci-fi conventions at all. Yeah. I don't do small size prints either, because they cost me the same amount of money as a full size print. 
So forget it. I don't. I don't do those. Um, but I do. Um, I do journals, um, and they sell really well for me. Um, so I don't know. That's a that's a tip for people. But that's really all I bring anymore. And I don't even tend to bring figurines very often and stuff. Even though I do mostly local shows, just because I find them a big pain in the butt. Yeah, <laughs> I know they're ridiculous, especially packing them up when the ones that you don't sell. I've no, I, I'll say I noticed at the last fairy con there were a lot fewer figurines on people's tables. Yeah. Because it seems like it's not worth it to transport them. Yeah, and you know what? You give have plenty of business cards. Have a mailing list uh, to sign up, like right there on your table. I have like a little mini clipboard with a little form I've made for the mailing list, and have people sign up for that. To give away business cards freely and tell people there's more on the website, and you do get follow up sales after the show. Um, I like to bring I like to bring the figurines and stuff because I don't like shipping those. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, that's when I just direct people to Joe. I don't even carry my figurines. They, I, people people yeah. that want to buy them, I send them to our sponsor, FairyGlen.com. Oh, see what I did there? Actually, I found a shop downtown here that sells your figurines, Bridget, and a lot of other people. And yeah, it's a little tiny store. Oh, cool. Well, thank you to them. What's their name? Uh, Mineralistic. Mineralistic. Awesome. Yes. Well, they yeah. used to, I mean, they, they started out just selling Amy's figures, like, years and years ago, but it, fantasy figuring seemed to have taken over their entire business, and their whole front room <laughs> is, like, half the artists I know, they've got their pieces in display cases, so. That's, that's, uh, that's cool. Yeah. Glad to see them supporting everybody. Um, that brings us, and I, I can tell already this is going to be a two-parter, plus uh, Jennifer Kelly, who uh, was with us a few times, couldn't make it this week, and she said that was a shame because she definitely felt like she had something to add. So I feel like you know this will definitely be uh, continued next week. But in our last few minutes here, um, let's think about real quick uh, selling to people because that was a question that we got on the website was selling yourself – and, and this is probably going to just get you, like, thinking, and then we're going to, like, follow up next week with this because uh, this is a heavy topic right here. But selling to the customer. And you know what? I worked in sales for years, and it's really different selling other people's stuff versus <laughs> selling your own. We have an unfair advantage mm -hmm. because I sell her stuff, and she sells mine. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> She's amazing, and, it's and she is. That's cheating. That's cheating. Thanks, friends. Yeah, but sorry. I. That's a, no, but why are you sorry? <laughs> that's very helpful because that makes me think about how uh, I think that that can definitely be an advantage. That's something to consider if you have a really tough time talking up your own work. Find an outgoing friend that you have, or like when my husband does shows with me. Um, a lot of times he'll take on that role and he'll start to talk about me and the work um, and to the customer and so because he knows that I'm uncomfortable and he's a, a pretty good sales guy that way and sometimes you might have a friend that could be helpful in that regard because it's really it's one thing to talk I've about that for people. Feel like you're selling it sorry I said I've done that for people on occasion oh cool cool um, Let's see. Uh, so yeah, we might have to like mull over that some more as far as tips or anything. Um, let's see. I I think we're gonna wrap it up here for today, guys, because I could definitely think of a few more topics, uh, a few more bullet points in here that I wanted to go over, and we just don't have the time. So please tune in next week. Thanks for being with us today. But tune in next week where we'll talk more about uh, selling your art to the customer and. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we have to say what's the what's the title of it again? Hold it's it back. Hunting up. the egret. Hunting the egret. Awesome. Available awesome. at it's on Kindle at the moment as an ebook. It'll be in print as soon as I can persuade them to squeeze copies out. So sometime soon. Excellent. A little bit, a little bit Charles Delint, a little bit Clive Barker. Excellent stuff. Awesome. Maybe this is how it works. Lovely <laughs> <laughs> cover. <laughs> Excellent, guys. Sorry. All right, so does anybody have any news to share before we go? Anything you want to plug other than Hunting the Egret, available on Kindle right now? <laughs> um, if you're going to Dragon Con or Anime Fest, 
this weekend. My art will be in both art shows. Cool. Excellent. Awesome. Alrighty. Well, I guess that's it for today. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week.